Hey everybody, this is Jonathan from Hexplorit. I'm here to show you guys the Mountains of Gadai. This is our latest installment in the Hexplorit series. It is set in one of two different regions that you can play and it is a tower defense. So we're gonna take this series a little bit slow so that I can walk you through all of the different things that we have in store. Let's dive in. So the first thing that you might notice is that this game is set up in a slightly different way than our previous Hexplorit volumes. For one thing, we have Empire tiles that we've added to this game. These Empire tiles are one hex larger than the uh, standard hex tiles that you're used to seeing. And they contain a city-state. One on the top and another on the bottom. Now when you set up your game, you're going to set up your city state so that it touches the game bar. So this one on top needs to touch the game bar on top. This city state on the bottom needs to touch the game bar on the bottom. The next thing to note is that each of the game pieces in this game are double sided. So if you'll notice, we have the jungle side face up. And so we're also using the jungle side of the game bars. You can check to make sure that you've got the right side by looking at the icon on the game bar. The next thing to note is the hex tiles. When you're setting up your game, you're going to start with two hex tiles revealed. So we'll take our hex tile tile here and we'll shuffle it. We'll grab two random hex tiles from the top. And then we're going to place those down in one of two locations on the board. If you'll notice, we have a siege portal right in between the two empire tiles. Now that is going to be a spawn location for some of the enemies that we have show up later in the game. So let's place these two down in a random way. <clears throat> So I've placed two tiles on the board and you can see that you can rotate these tiles in any way that you'd like when you begin the game. Now I'm going to set aside the rest of the hex tiles because we are not actually going to use these yet. They may come into play at other times during the game. Um, as you explore the map, you will go ahead and um, reveal more of it. Also, your opponents can reveal the map. So if Jathy is on the board and she moves into a spot that is free and you can place a tile there, then you will. And same thing goes with the banners. So I'm going to set this aside. So then the next thing that you're going to do is you place your first sky tile before play begins. Now, if you'll notice, I, I mentioned a little bit about the siege portals. There are actually four siege portals on each uh, of the game. Well, there's one siege portal on each of the game bars. And then there's going to be six siege portals in play in the middle of the map. We've already talked about the one in the middle, but we're also going to place two more. One on the left side of the map and one on the right side of the map. This creates a total of 10 siege portals in play. That's easy to remember because you're going to be rolling a 10-sided die to determine which portal is going to be a trigger. So for instance, if we're going to place a sky tile on the board, that's going to be these guys here, um, we would be rolling a 10-sided die and then a 6-sided die. It looks like I've got my wander graphic upside down here, but I'll place another graphic on the screen so we can take a look at it. So I'm going to grab dice and we're going to do a quick roll and see what we get. Okay, so we're going to roll a d10 and a d6. We get a 5 for the portal, and that would be right here. And we get a hex for the direction. So whenever you're wandering, uh, this is a game effect that can happen to your heroes. It can happen to different units in the game. Basically, you're going to be rolling a d6, and you check your wander graphic, and you move one hex in the location that you rolled. In this case, we rolled a hex, which is uh, north. It looked like it was coming down on, on the screen there. Um, but because 
that would place it on a siege portal, you have to re-roll that d6. So we're going to roll the d6 one more time, and we get a 5. Now 5 is going to be in this direction, so um, if we look at where that would be placed, it would be placed right here. So that means we are going to place a random sky tile before play on the location that we rolled. And I will place this one in any location that uh, we rolled. So because we rolled that spot here, I can either place the sky tile in it right here, or I can place it right here. Now, I guess I'll place it right there for now. <clears throat> Now, sky tiles are special locations that require a keyword for your heroes to go into. You might be able to get elements. We can see that this tile in particular contains water. So we can actually harvest elemental water in this location when the game begins. Now, um, because I don't have those sky tile risers in this version, we're not going to place a riser underneath it. And I'll move the dice out of the way, and I will move the uh, sky tiles out of the way, because we're only going to place one at the beginning. Your core box comes with many tokens. When you reveal something on the map that has an elemental portal, in this case, we've revealed a water portal before play begins, you're going to place a matching elemental token on that location. And that's just going to remind the players that you can go to this location and get elemental token, in this case, water. Now, also, when you begin the game, you will see that our boss layers are not actually numbered in this game. So when you reveal a boss layer, you're going to take a random boss token and you can see the tokens that we have here. So I'm going to take a random boss token, and I'm going to place it on top uh, of that location. Now, there's a play style where you can either keep it um, unknown, and you will only flip over this tile when your heroes actually go within range of this tile uh, token, or you can place it, um, which is the generic way of doing this, when you begin the game, you're simply going to flip it over and that will tell you what boss is at that location. So in this location, we have boss number four. So this allows you to see what is there. And by default, you'll be placing them face up. Now that we've set up our map, our portals, our sky tile, and any tokens on the board, it's time to place your decks on the applicable spots on the game bar. I've placed three decks so far. Uh, there's a few other decks that I need to talk about. So let's take a look. First of all, we have the Harvest deck on the bottom, the Encounter deck also on the bottom bar, and our Power Up deck. We also have two separate Commission decks. We have the Capricorn deck as well as the Ishidan deck. Now, because we are playing both of the empires in Capricorn, we're simply going to use this deck. We're going to split it in half, roughly, and we're going to place one half on the top bar, right here, and one half on the bottom bar. Now, you can play this game with both empires if you would like. You could play, let's say, if we had this top bar as the Ishidan Empire, then we would place the entire Ishidan deck on the top, and we would place the entire Capricorn deck on the bottom. But because we do have both uh, of the Capricorn city-states in play, we're simply going to take that deck of cards, uh, cut it in half, and place both, roughly, decks on each side. Okay. Um, all right, so then the next thing is I'm going to take the Ishidan deck and I'm going to set it aside. We're not going to be playing with it in this game. <clears throat> and finally, that's going to lead us to creating the villain deck. Now, the villain deck in this game is created in a very particular way, which allows for sieges to happen roughly in um, standard increments during the game. So you're not going to have these wildly uh, strange games where you go for a very long time where a siege is not occurring 
or um, a siege is happening every other round. So that's not going to be how it works. We actually have to put in a little bit of effort to create the, the villain deck in a way before play begins. All right, so we're ready to build our villain deck. The first thing that we're going to note is that there are five siege cards um, in this deck, and each one is tied to an element. So before you begin play, you're going to take all five of those element cards, those siege cards, and you're going to set them aside. Each siege will occur over time. You can have up to five sieges in your game. That would be a very long game. Uh, a medium game would be four sieges, or a short game would be three. So we're going to decide whether or not we're going to play with five, four, or three siege cards in this game. So once you've taken your five siege cards out, we are going to place them in a random fashion so we don't know which cards are which. And we are going to place them into piles. So I'm simply going to take all those cards and shuffle them, place them right in a line here. <clears throat> Okay, so once we have our five siege cards, then we're going to place extra cards from the deck, uh, randomize, we'll shuffle this deck, and we'll place three cards on top of each. And again, this is another way that you can customize the duration of your game. You can add in more cards if you want a longer game, and we'll place three in this deck, um, that way it will be a short game. And... <clears throat> So yeah, so it's very custom customizable. So I'm going to place three cards on top of each deck. Okay, once you've placed all of your cards, you're going to take the remaining deck and you're just going to set it aside for now. So now that we have our decks, we're going to shuffle each one so that we don't know where the siege card is in this pile. We'll just do that on all five. And then finally, once you have all five of these shuffled, we're going to take out of random, uh, randomize, we're going to take however many sieges we want for this particular game. So we'll go with three for this game. So I'm going to just take three random piles, and I'm going to place them one on top of the other, just like so. And the other cards we're going to set aside. We're not going to use them. And finally, one more step. We take the top two cards out of the remain the remainder of the deck and we're going to place that on top of our villain deck okay so this creates your villain deck for play with random siege cards intermixed within the deck in roughly the same amount of cards between so we're going to place this villain deck here on the top of your game bar and we are now ready for that. One last thing is our siege cards. Each of these cards has a element type associated with it. So you have a deck for each element type. <clears throat> we are going to keep those within their types. So you're not going to take these and shuffle them together. We're going to leave them the way they are, but I'm going to set them off to the side. During play, we're going to roll a element die and we based on what the die result is will determine which card we draw and place in the various siege slots along our siege bar so let's put these aside and we can move on to the next step okay the next part of setup includes preparing your defenders we have two city states on the map and we have a temple on the map now, when you begin the game, uh, you will have access to towers 
which I have 3D printed these little plastic pieces here. Uh, when the game actually ships, you will have full color versions of these that are right on the punch board. And we did that so that you can flip them over and have um, the uh, backside be a ruined or destroyed tower. Um, so these are just placeholders for now. Your game will um, show a slightly different format for, for those towers and fortresses. Now, towers are the first version of your uh, hero placed defenders. These are locations that are placed on the board by your heroes, and they can be upgraded from a tower into a fortress. Now, they are uh, number coded as well. So tower one can be upgraded to fortress one, and tower two can be upgraded to fortress two, tower three to fortress three. You will generally not have a fortress before you have placed the tower. Now, there are some situations in the game where a card might say place a fortress or um, do, you know, circumvent the normal system. But in this case, generally, you're just going to upgrade from one to the next. Now, when play begins, you're going to place your tower in any location on the map. And this tower is going to begin the game with slightly less resilience. It's a bit of a damaged tower. Um, now you can choose not to place the tower and gain platinum instead. This is part of the first initial strategy available to your heroes. So in this particular case, I'm going to place the tower down in any location uh, that I would like. And um, I will just place it right here in the, in the desert, uh, uh, right over here. Okay. Now that we have our defenders on the board, we need to fill out our defender uh, mats. Now these are going to be uh, laminated just like your hero boards. Um, I just trimmed these out by hand so you'll see a bunch of excess lamination on the sides. Your version will not look like this. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to fill out their initial stats before play begins on anything that's revealed. So in this case we have City State 1, City State 2, the Temple, and the tower, tower number one. Now temples um, are actually shared locations. So there's only one defender mat for all temples. This is kind of an interesting scenario because as more temples get placed on the board, they will all share the same power, potential, and elements that you've basically put into these locations. So, as you get those more powered, you will be basically um, copying that particular defender in multiple locations on the map. For all other defenders, they get their own defender mat. So I'm going to take a few minutes and fill out all of my defender tokens here, and then we'll come right back and take a closer look to see what we have. Okay, I've filled out my defender cards. I'm going to place them um, on the board. We have a few different locations to do so. Any defenders that we're not using, I'm going to place right here on the game bar uh, along with this enhancing defenders um, reminder. Now, this is the back of tower number four. So you can pick this up and it's a quick and easy reminder of how you can enhance your defenders during the game. This happens during the event phase while you're playing. So I'm going to place those down because they're not currently being used. If I place a new tower on the board, I'll pick that up and then I'll fill it in. Um, if we have uh, you know something else that that comes in, obviously we'll we'll pick it up at that point. Next, we have our temple card, and the temples we currently only have temple number one shown on the map. So I've filled in the resilience <clears throat> of temple number one. I'll go through all of the icons in a moment when talking about resilience and, and the different attributes that your defenders possess. For now, let's place the rest of these. So I have uh, city state number two, and I'm going to place that right on this game bar next to city state number two. During the siege phase, we're going to pick this up and we're going to basically record any changes to that city state if it suffers damage same thing for city state number one i'm going to place that right here 
and that is tied to this city state. Then we have tower number one, and I'm just going to place that right here. <clears throat> Okay, let's talk about defenders and what they can do. Defenders, much like your heroes, are targets for siege opponents. Now, siege opponents are a special type of opponent in the Mountains of Gadai that generally only target the defenders, but your heroes can get in the way and suffer damage. So you'll want to use your, your strategy to um, really consider where the heroes are on the board during the siege stage. Now, in this game, unlike um, previous Hexplorit volumes, your heroes do not die forever if they die in this game. Your city-states are watching over your heroes just as your heroes are watching over your city-states. So instead, there's a timer that will happen. If your heroes die, they will be revived after a short period of time, and um, the siege will continue without you on the board. Now, the defenders that you have, you will have several different icons on the defender card. You have resilience, which is effectively their hit points or their the health of this particular unit. You have potential, which is the number of dice that this location rolls when it attacks siege opponents. Then you have power, which is the target number for those potential rolls. So let's take, uh, let's take for example, uh, your tower has, um, let's say it has five potential. So that means you would be rolling five dice. <clears throat> and if you have uh, your tower, let's say has power of four, basically a hit from this tower would occur on a result of four or lower for any of those rolls. So for a potential five, power four, we would roll five dice, and we would check to see what those numbers are. So we see a hex, and that's actually gonna be a critical, and that means you're doing two siege, two siege damage. A three is less than four, and four is equal to four. So we have three hits, one of which is a surge, or critical hit in this case. All right, so that's the difference between power and potential. Now, another, um, another thing that your defenders have is range. Just like siege opponents, your defenders will be able to only reach so far on the map to affect um, different targets. So siege opponents also have this value, and we'll see that in play in a little bit. Okay, so I've talked about um, resilience, potential, power and range. At the bottom of your defender cards, you're going to see a line of elements. Now you can augment elements to these locations to give them added abilities and effects. This can be found on the elemental placard uh, as a reference as you're um, playing the game. In addition to the elements, you'll see a spot for the two different types of resources that can be allocated to these locations. That would be specialists uh, on the right side and recruits on the left side. Now, based on what you place in these towers, it will give you different effects. For instance, recruits on the left side, these are a tier one resource and you can effectively place them into your towers and your defenders. By having them there, they will prevent uh, opponents from using the retreat keyword. The specialists, on the other hand, will diminish the effectiveness of other keywords that these opponents possess. So if we look on the defender card, it says minus one arcing, minus one bulwark, minus one ignite, and minus one overpower. If you have four specialists in let's say our tower, you would be effectively uh, placing a modifier on your siege opponents equal to minus four arcing, bulwark, ignite, and overpower. So that's an, a, a great way of diminishing the effectiveness of your siege opponents. All right, so I think we're ready. The next thing I'm going to do is we are going to roll our starting location. Starting location begins on either city state one or city state two. 
and you can begin in any hex of that location. And to do so, we're simply going to roll a six-sided die. And the six-sided die basically is just going to be a even or odd result. Even result is going to be um, city state two. Odd result is city state one. And we have an even result. So we're gonna start down here. So I'm gonna place our uh, token on any of those locations there. So I'm just gonna place her right here. Now there's one last thing we can do, and that is to roll for gear. And that is going to be based on the location that we start in. So if we check out the rule book, that will give us the different things that we're gonna be doing um, as part of this last step in setting up our game. So if you notice, um, I'm going to roll the, the element dice first. <clears throat> We also have initial equipment that we'll gain. I haven't made my characters yet. I'll do that in the next step. I'm not going to show that step here uh, on this video as we've actually shown uh, hero creation before in the past, um, but I will bring those heroes in and describe them after I've made them. So as part of setup though, let's go ahead and roll the element dice. So we're going to roll all five of the element dice. And these dice are explained in greater detail in the rule book. And we're just going to simply look to see what we have acquired here. Now, I see three air results, one earth result, and one void surge. So, and I know that's probably a little difficult to see um, on the screen there. I'll try and... Um, magnify those results in a moment here but basically those results will give us certain things uh, at the beginning of the game all right so i'm gonna put all of this into our resources placard and we'll come back to look at that our results were three air one earth and one void surge what that's going to do is give us 12 ore four lumber two recruits, one sky metal, four platinum, and we get to roll the void die one more time to see if we gain an element. So I'm just gonna show that card here and um, that will show you that we've got these built into our stockpile and platinum right at the top. All right, so let's re-roll that void die and see if we gain an element. <clears throat> and we gain air. So we will have also one air element that I'm going to place right here before the game begins. All right, so that's it. Game setup is complete. Uh, I'll move these off to the side. I'm going to create my characters. In this game, I'm going to be creating a sage and a wind rider. And we will show how the game plays and progresses. I don't know if I'll be playing an entire game, but I will certainly walk you through all of the different steps uh, for each of the different phases. Um, so let's take a look. Greetings, Wind Riders. I'm back with a Wind Rider of my own. I've got my heroes made. I also changed up the setup here because I noticed in the previous section the camera was wiggling a little bit. So I wanted to correct that. Uh, we have our heroes. So I've chosen the Zumacane Wind Rider and the Kobold Sage. Now, each of these heroes comes with a plethora of abilities that they can use. The Zumacane uh, racial ability, <clears throat> let's just read that. Fierce and dramatic, their celebrations always honor the gods. Once per game turn after you or the group draws a power up, you may spend two health to draw two and keep one. Place the other card on top or on the bottom of the power up deck. So my Zumacane Wind Rider is gonna be able to manipulate cards coming off of the power up deck. My Kobold Sage, uh, has also a special ability here, and I'll read that. Um, kobolds quarrel constantly and upheave local power structures. Before play begins, choose a basic element type and gain one augment tier. Up to once per game turn for two energy, you may increase one of your element augment tiers by one, and that lasts a game turn. So, I chose water. Um, so, my sage, uh, his name is Zix, uh, has a water 
um, augmentation right at the beginning of the game because of that kobold ability. Now, I've chosen water because it gives me a couple of things that complement this character in a pretty good way. Now, the sage is a healer, and so he excels at uh, healing and keeping the party alive. This water augmentation will also help us against fire um, siege opponents. So water uh, will take out fire. And I don't know if you can see this, but on the, I'll put it on the video too, but on the bar, uh, all the way over to the right hand side, you're going to see a little compass. And we place that on the bar so that you could see which of the elements overtakes the other elements. So for instance, water overtakes fire, fire overtakes air, air overtakes earth, and earth overtakes water. Now void, placed directly in the center of that compass, takes over all of the other four, and nothing can take over void. So that's how the elements kind of counteract one another in this game. <clears throat> okay, so I've gone over my racial abilities. Let's take a look at the Wind Rider. The Wind Rider gains soar, and can increase the group's movement speed by two while we're moving recklessly. Um, then we have Whirlwind and Ascend, uh, two special abilities on the Wind Rider. And the Wind Rider is a utility class. Okay, so we have our Sage, and the Sage also has a special ability that's more of a passive. So the passive for our Sage is up to twice per game turn. You can spend two energy to either grant a target an elemental subtype favored opponent of their choice until the end of the game turn, or to grant a minus three bonus on a harvest test. So the nice thing about this is that um, we can use the Sage's ability to uh, possibly increase our chances at getting higher tier resources <clears throat> that we would otherwise have to um, camp in place and try and get those bonuses in order to get a higher chance of receiving them later. I'll show you all of that in a moment. Okay, then we have Resonance and Attune. Those are the special abilities of the Sage. Okay, so we're almost ready. Uh, we have our roles, our races. We have our Water Augment for the Sage. We have our Defenders. All put together, we have our card decks out. We have our tower on the board. We're uh, let's see, we're on the second uh, is that Manchu Pakra, which is the city state that we're in, and we have all of the siege opponents ready to go right here. So let's go. The balance of our universe has tilted for far too long. Powerful beings have interfered with the fabric of this world, causing it to fray erratically at its edges. This imbalance has drawn the attention of its keeper, Jathi, the titan of magic, the source of the wellspring, and the keeper of patterns. She now returns to the world to restore balance by unraveling all its patterns to remake the world anew. Can we gather the strength necessary to oppose her? To right our wrongs and restore balance to our world? Will we bravely stand our ground alone against the terrifying titan of our world? There's only one way to find out. Drum roll, please. All right, let's get started. So, <clears throat> one other thing to note. When you are playing this game, uh, you are going to have a acquire amount and a harvest uh, a group range. Now, group range is inherited by the roll type of the group. We have a utility in the group and a sage in the group. The utility has a range of one. That means you count one hex away from your current location, and that would be your range. So we have basically, for the Wind Rider, we have the range of the equivalent of a sky tile. The place that we're in, and then one hex around all of the uh, our current position. Now the Sage, because the Sage is a healer, just like uh, the Sapper, we have a larger range for the Sage. So the Sage has a range of two. That would be the location that we're on, one hex away, and a second hex away. So our current range is the larger of the two and becomes two hexes. 
Now that's going to come in handy when we are in our harvest stage because we will have more range to affect the world and to gain resources. Okay, so we're gonna start our game in the harvest stage. This is by default. You will never start the game in the siege phase. Again, sieges will occur sometime uh, after we draw these cards in the JT deck. We place this deck and we created this deck in a certain way that those siege cards are going to come out at certain times. So the first thing we're gonna do as part of the harvest stage is draw a harvest card. Draw this card and see what it is. Okay, so this is the Golden City. A recent discovery has changed everything we think we know. Now, resource cards, uh, sorry, harvest cards have what you will find as immediate effects and end of stage effects. So the immediate effects are played immediately. And then we hold on to the card until the end of the stage. And then we play the end of stage effects all at, at once at the end in the order that we've played these harvest cards. A recent discovery has changed everything we think we know. Until the end of the harvest stage, you may face a dangerous encounter in any antiquity site. Those are the white locations. So we have uh, two antiquity sites on the map, right here and right here. For each encounter vanquished, gain loot five and double rewards. Loot is a keyword that basically means um, you are going to gain an item at the end of combat <clears throat> worth gold value of the number or lower from any Explorate game. So <clears throat> we will be able to loot five, that means gain one item worth five gold or less for every encounter that we defeat anytime we are in a antiquity site. Okay and double the rewards for that encounter. Additionally, antiquity sites become harvest seven, five platinum, and five gold. What this means is during the harvest stage, we can harvest from that location, and it will be a harvest seven, which is a keyword. Basically, we have to roll a 10-sided die and gain that number or lower in order to gain whatever follows behind that keyword. So harvest seven, five and platinum and five gold. So that would be amazing for us to get some additional platinum. Okay, then we have the end of stage effect, which is for every three platinum gathered during the harvest stage, gain one more platinum. So now we have a little bit of a uh, incentive here to go for platinum while we are harvesting. Now we also have a reward in the bottom right hand corner of this card and it's because this is a resource type card. It has the resource ribbon. Now when we see this card or this icon it means that we are going to be able to take this bonus at the end of the harvest stage after all end of stage effects have been played. So at the end of the harvest stage, we will get 10 more platinum. That will be amazing. All right. Now it is the movement phase because we've drawn our harvest card. We're going to go right into the movement phase. Now our wind rider has soar just by default of being a wind rider. Our sage also has soar because of the griffin mount that we acquired at the beginning of the game with the uh, items that we gained at the beginning. Now they both have two Viper potions, but instead of the Wind Rider taking a Griffin mount like Zix the Sage, uh, Enti, our Wind Rider, has taken a Fireheart Scepter. Now the Fireheart Scepter will give her plus two to damage and will that damage will increase if she gains a Fire Augment. So that will be one of my strategies later on is if we can get access to a fire element, we're going to put that onto the Wind Rider for added bonus damage. All right, so movement. Uh, we can move into the sky tiles. We have Soar, and we can move pretty far. Um, why don't we go and try and get to that antiquity site right away? I think that would be a really good idea. We can open up another part of the map, 
And uh, if we can get there, we might be able to take advantage of some of this uh, platinum gain. One, two, three, four, five, six, right to here. And then we'll open up a new hex tile. Lots of water. <clears throat> And we have revealed a new boss layer. So we will also place a boss token on this location. And the boss token will be placed face up <clears throat> to reveal that this is boss number six. Okay, so we've moved. Now it is time for, uh, let's see, we've moved recklessly. This means that we suffer a little bit of energy drain. And uh, let's see, let's actually read the Wind Rider special ability again. You gain soar and the group's movement speed increases by two while moving recklessly. So actually we can move further. So normal speed is four, plus two for reckless and plus two more because of the Wind Rider. So we can move two more right to here. Now also, Additionally, anytime you extend the map, you may place an additional map tile adjacent to the first tile placed. So we can place another tile on the board right here. And we can see many, uh, two more antiquity sites opened up. Ah, one thing I forgot to do <clears throat> before the game begins as part of setup, you flip over the two commission decks. So uh, at least the first card on top of those decks. These are going to be locations that we can go to to complete quests and missions for this empire. So let's flip that over. We have Obsidian Death for an ant uh, antiquity site. A Explore. And we have the Jade Jaguar, also an antiquity site. And that one is a navigate and explore. So, all right, <clears throat> we have quite a bit that we can accomplish here, especially because both of those are in antiquity sites. I can definitely see that that's gonna be our future here. All right, now that we have moved recklessly, we have a little bit of energy drain to take. So moving recklessly is going to cost us two energy drain. So we go down to eight energy and six energy for our Sage. Uh, then we have our skills. So let's roll some skills. Because we've moved recklessly, we have to uh, choose one of our skills to automatically fail. Now I am going to choose, let's see, I'm going to, they both have one for survival. So I'm going to choose our survival to fail. We will have to eat. Um, my wind rider has a food rating of two and the sage has a food rating of one. So we're going to suffer some food loss here. And then we're going to roll our green and, uh, our yellow. And we have five and seven. We, we are going to wander. We miss our navigate. We have a six and a six. Ah, our sage actually received some gold. We found some treasure. So the gold is going to be increased here. <clears throat> and we're going to wander. So let's roll the d6 and we're going to check the result against the wander graphic. And we have a five, which just like when we placed that sky tile is going to put us off the mark. We actually ended up right over here. Okay, so now that we have moved, it is time for our event phase. Now, during the event phase of the harvest stage, we're going to be harvesting from the location that we ended up. So because we have a range of two, that would be like placing a hex tile right over the top of our location. And that means that's how much range we have to work with. We're going to select four locations within this range and we're going to reference our location or terrain card. And this is the resources um, aid that will help us know what we can 
um, what we can actually harvest from. Now, if we look, we find that a antiquity site is actually in range uh, of our location. And if we consult our Golden City card here, we see that uh, this location is a harvest seven, five uh, gold, five platinum. Okay, so I think that's the beautif a beautiful thing for us to harvest. We're going to try and go for that platinum. Let's see what else is in range. I see a bunch of water and a bunch of forest. Uh, let's do water, um, and that will give us some food. That's going to give each uh, hero two gold and six food, and that's immediate. So every hero gets it right away. So I'm going to increase my food by six and my gold by two. And that's all I can carry for food. So we are full on food now. <clears throat> then let's go with uh, two forest and our fourth harvest because our acquire amount is four. Our fourth harvest is going to be that uh, antiquity site. So two forest is going to give us two lumber. Now, instead of placing this uh, number in the stockpile, when you're harvesting, you're placing it down here. And then at the end of the stage, these numbers might get modified and then brought up into your stockpile. Now, you cannot upgrade your defenders from this location here, the harvest yield, but you can um, increase your defenders from the stockpile. So also as part of this stage, I can spend anything that's up here and uh, upgrade or enhance the towers or the city states. And during the harvest stage, you can do that regardless of your location. So even though I'm not in range of the temple or the city state or my tower, I can spend this to increase their, their abilities. So I'm not going to do that just yet. I'm going to keep everything here off to the side. Um, okay, so then let's roll for that special harvest ability. Now it's a harvest seven, so we need to roll a 10 slide to die and get seven or lower. And we get a nine. Okay, well, this is why we have the sage. So the Sage, up to twice per game turn, you may spend two energy to grant one target an elemental subtype favorite opponent, or to grant a minus three bonus on a harvest test. So we're going to do that. Minus three bonus to the harvest test. And your abilities are always interrupt, uh, unless otherwise stated. You can use your abilities at any time to help um, the situation at hand. So two energy we uh will have that nine reduced by three to a six which is under seven and we get five uh let's see five platinum and that's going to go again in down here in the harvest yield and because it's gold the gold is received right away on a per hero basis so both heroes gain five more gold this is going to be amazing when we go in and uh, purchase some gear upgrades later. Okay, so after the harvest stage is done, then we have any other events on our location. We're not actually on a location that has events, but we could spend any of our resources to increase our defenders. I think I'm gonna wait and do that in a little bit. So we have the villain phase and we draw Athey's card. Okay, Jathie's card is Elemental Tapestry. She is infusing everything with her energy. After rolling to place a Siege Opponent card, increase the matching imbalance amount by three. All right, so this card has all three icons that appear in the villain deck. On the bottom uh, right side of this card, you are going to see three icons. The first icon is an increase to the calendar, and each card in JT's deck has this icon. So for this one, it's a plus one, and that means we're going to increase the calendar 
by one, and I'm gonna fill in that bubble, that first bubble on the calendar. The next icon that we see on this card is an encounter icon, and that's right next to that plus one calendar. That means we draw an encounter and we have to face it. So let's see what it is. <clears throat> okay, we have an undead ever-burning skull. Are we good against undead? We have creature for wind rider and we have monstrous opponent a monstrous humanoid for the sage unfortunately we're not good against we do not have favorite opponent against the ever burning skull okay so this um this particular opponent is a level two it has six uh health and three energy it's going to give us three gold and it looks like um, it is doing uh, some some nasty things to us. Um, it is soulless, which means that it can be destroyed by reducing its energy to zero. Um, and it has weakness to water. Hey, that's interesting. We have the sage who is uh, good against water. So that means the Sage is going to gain some additional damage to this opponent. Uh, also, it looks like it also has loot. So at the end of this game turn, we're going to gain um, a keyword. Uh, that means we get to grab an item worth three gold or less. All right, so this should be pretty easy. We have a whole bunch of things going for us in this fight. We have six uh, health and three energy on this particular opponent. So I'm using the battle mat here to write that down. Six in the health spot and three in the energy. And we're going to do some damage. So the first thing we're gonna do is I'm just gonna have our Wind Rider defend. They will uh, use vantage point. And the Sage, because we have weakness to water here, and the Sage has the water augment, we are doing a d6 of damage right off the bat. And that is just as if it were a favorite opponent. And that explodes. That's a six plus another six and two. So that is 14 damage that our Kobold Sage just zapped the ever-burning skull basically took that that fire hose and just doused him and put him out of his misery so 14 damage it's gonna die uh let's see what it does to us so we'll roll the d6 and we roll a one and this is single three piercing health now it is a single target that means it could target the wind rider or the sage we're going to roll two 10-sided dice, that's called target dice, and we're going to see which of these two uh, rolls are going to take the hit. The highest roll is going to take the hit. We'll go with green for the Wind Rider and yellow for the Sage. And of course, it's the Sage. Uh, that 14 damage of fire, uh, uh, of water damage, is uh, attracted the Ever-Burning Skull, who's doing three piercing damage to our Sage. Our Sage is down to four health remaining, and the combat has uh, concluded. Okay, now we are going to gain three gold each. And we are going to gain uh, one item worth three gold or less. So I'm going to take a look at the items placard here, and I'm going to select the Bull's Elixir. Yes, indeed, Bull's Elixir for both of us. And in fact, Zix is going to use his right away because he is feeling uh, pretty burnt right now. So he's going to gain. Uh, let's see, that would be raise 4 health and 4 energy and gain block 10 next round. It's not a combat, but he is going to regain all of that lost uh, health. Bring us back up to full.
Okay, so that's uh, that's great. We are done with that encounter card. All right, so we've gone through the first two icons on this JT card. The bottom icon is a special icon. Normally, will be a one of the five element dice. Now, this icon in particular is an any element. That basically means we can choose one of the elements to roll. And because of part of this card, it says um, increase the matching imbalance amount by three. So whatever we roll, we will be increasing that imbalance. Um, let's see, we're good against fire. So I'm going to choose to roll the fire die. Because if we get fire, and there will be a 50% chance that we get fire off of this die, uh, then at least we have a little bit more power over it. And it's void. Oh, the worst roll result we could have had. Void is the um, pinnacle of elements. And so starting the game with an imbalance of three for void is, uh, that's pretty bad. So we'll see what that will mean later. Find the actual placard we need here. Oh, it's on the back of the battle mat. Okay, on the back of the battle mat, we have JT's siege placard. And what we see is that we have tables for each of the five elements and an imbalance spot for each of the five elements. So now we're going to read this card again. It says, increase the matching imbalance amount by three. The, Im the void imbalance is now three. So I've written that down. <clears throat> okay. And whatever we roll on this die, we are going to place that type of opponent in the first siege slot. So we've rolled void, and now we're going to place a void card without looking at it. We're going to place it in the first slot of this um, siege bar. Now that's going to mean that the first siege opponent that comes out uh, onto the board, or at least this card, will be a void opponent. All right, so I'm going to just set these cards aside. We will uh, do more of them later. So she is infusing everything with her energy. Jathy is off to a terrible start. Uh, terrible for us. Good for her, I guess. All right, so that's the end of the game turn. I know I've taken a good amount of time to describe all of this. Typically, your game turns don't last this long. So we're going to go a little bit faster with this next one. Okay, first of all, draw the harvest card. True Earth. Earth will crush our enemies. This one also has an immediate effect. Gain a minus three bonus to harvest elements until the end of this harvest stage. So harvesting elements, if we take a look at the uh, resource card, we can see where elements are, are gained. We find by terrain, they're gained on sky tiles. So we could gain an element here. If we flip it over by location, we see them, that there are two locations on this side that we can get them. In temples, there's a chance using the harvest keyword to get elements there. And there's also a way that you could get them on elemental portals, which is actually right on the middle of this sky tile. Um, so we can get elements there, and because of this card, they will be easier to harvest. But I still want to get over to that antiquity site. The amount of platinum from that initial card is calling to me. All right, so that is the card. There is nothing else to do with, with this for the harvest stage. So now we get to move. We'll move two, one, two. That is not moving cautiously, so we will be rolling um, our skills. Place this down here. We're gonna roll both the skills, get all the other dice out of the way. Let me just organize my hand here, okay. So we have five, Six did not make anything. We have a hex over here on survival. We have a four and a six. Okay, we did not make navigate, so we are going to wander. We rolled a one, 
which means we would wander into the siege portal. Good thing about this is that we cannot move into the siege portal. That means we do not wander and we stay on this antiquity site. That's pretty great. Okay, uh, so let me just suffer some energy uh, food loss here. We get some gold here. And we, because of this hex on survival, we actually are gaining one resource of our choice, and that is added directly to the stockpile. Um, now, because it's only one hex, we get a tier one um, resource. So I'm gonna say, let's go with a lumber. I'm gonna increase our lumber from a four to a five. Put this aside. <clears throat> Um, and then we are going to have the event phase. First thing we're going to do is let's go for uh, the obsidian death and the card over here. So let me grab that. All right, uh, let's roll explore. <clears throat> so in the ext, it's a little small here. In the ext. Lilton Highlands, deep in the belly of the sleeping volcano, crystallized obsidian was harvested long ago to enhance weapons of war. Now these secrets have resurfaced anew. Warriors across the empire can once again be outfitted in Makwahuitl, the obsidian death. Okay, equip. This is an equip card. It means if we gain this, we can actually equip this on one of our defenders if we would like to do that. All right, so we are going to roll our um, Explorer. Uh, we have a one rank for the Wind Rider and a six rank for the Sage. So I'm hoping the Sage can do it. We have a four for the Wind Rider and a six for the Sage. We just barely squeaked by. Uh, the Sage is on a high after defeating uh, that ever-burning skull. And we have found the Obsidian Death. Okay, so a couple of things. This card is also uh, has a resource uh, in the bottom right. This is the reward for gaining this card. And we get this right away added to the stockpile. So we're going to add uh, the stockpile. Let's see, 12, 17. So we now have 17 uh, total ore. That's going to be amazing to give a resilience bonus to one of, well, to any of our uh, defenders. Okay, so I'm going to set this aside. We have an equip effect. I'm not going to use it just yet. Uh, the next thing that happens is we're going to flip over that next Capricorn card. And the card that was revealed is a roll card. It's a specific to the astrologist. Now the astrologist is not in play. So we just basically take this card and recycle it. Flipping over the next one, blood sacrifice. After we are finished with this particular uh, antiquity site you're going to place a hex tile uh, or a hex token on top of it we're going to do our harvest uh, action first and and then place that token over the top of it okay so uh let's go with three Ooh, we are in range of a mountain peak so a mountain peak if we look at our terrain card that will give us a chance to gain a sky medal so I think we're gonna do that. We're gonna roll for a sky metal and we're going to roll for the harvest seven platinum one more time. Okay, then the other two, I think we'll do two forests and that will give us two lumber. So I don't have to roll for those. I'm just gonna put two more lumber. I'm going to input that into my harvest yield here. So it's there. Um, and then we're going to roll for the mountain peak, four or less. We get a hex. Amazing. That means we are going to get that sky metal that we're after. And that sky metal, again, will be placed 
right here. Okay. And then we are rolling a seven or less and we get a seven. That means we also gain that amazing, um, the golden city. Um, this becomes a harvest seven, five platinum, five gold. Now we could attempt to face a dangerous encounter if we wanted to press our luck here and gain loot five and double the rewards. But I don't know if we want to press our luck to do that. So I don't think we're going to be uh, facing the dangerous encounter. We're just going to take what we've got and be happy with it. In a larger group, we might want to. Uh, all right, so that is five gold. And as you can see, we are loading up on the gold already because of this card this is amazing we've gotten what is that 10 10 gold each um okay now that we're finished with our event phase we've harvested we're going to place that hex token on this location that means we cannot gain the benefits from this location again because we have uh, used we've found the obsidian death here <clears throat> Okay, the end of the turn, we are going to have Jathy's card drawn. Uh, okay, and now this is a discovery, the Lighthouse of Omotochi. Secure this token and flip it over by traveling to it. If it is not secured by the end of the harvest stage, discard this discovery. Place this token on any water hex at least six hexes away from the group. Okay, so it has to be this way. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it could be right here. We could put it there. Let's do that. All right, so I'm going to grab the discovery token that goes with this location. Put it here. There it is. And I'm going to place it there with the green side face up. Now we don't uh, get the discoveries until we actually go to these locations. So we have to secure this discovery. Um, otherwise, Jathy and her elemental forces are going to swallow it up and we're not actually going to be able to make use of it. So, and I don't know when the next siege is going to happen, but we should have plenty of time we've just gone through two cards so unless the siege is the first card on that stack we can go ahead and and wait uh, but let's let's take a look to see what this does as the waves pull away from the shoreline an ancient lighthouse is revealed magic lay dormant within its stony wall a bright amber light rotates from its top floor guiding strangers in the night okay so we've already placed the token. If it is secured defenders within 10 hexes of the lighthouse, oh, that's gonna be that's gonna be the temple and our tower and the city state. Uh, defenders within 10 hexes of the lighthouse gain plus one range. While the group is in range of this token, heroes gain a minus two bonus to stat tests. Okay, this is going to be a really nice uh, discovery if we can if we can secure it. We should try and secure it right away next turn. Okay, so now that we have revealed this card from Jathy's deck, we are going to play the plus one calendar. Um, so that is going to increase the calendar right here. Plus one. Fill in that next that and then we find the blue die is on the bottom of this card so we are going to roll uh, the water die and it is a water surge okay well we can already tell that water in, is definitely in balance here because Zix just took out that uh, enraged um, ever-burning skull with a huge blast of water. And now we, we have a, a, a surge of water on the die. That means that not only do we draw one 
uh, water card, but we draw two water cards. First card drawn goes on top of Siege uh, 1, the Siege 1 slot. The second one drawn goes on Siege 2. Because this is a surge, we now will have two banners in play during the siege phase. So anytime you have a surge, you're placing one card on the current slot and one card on the, the next slot over. Okay. So that is the end of that uh, villain phase. It's our turn. Um, I think we're going to have to try and secure this discovery, but we have to land there. Uh, we we have to be able to stop movement there. So let's go one, two, three, four, five, six. We have to move recklessly to get there. Uh, okay, and let's see if we manage it. We're going to be moving reckless. We take some energy drain. Uh, oh, I got ahead of myself. Instead of moving first, we draw that harvest card first. True air. Air will choke our adversaries. Gain a minus three bonus to harvest elements until the end of the harvest stage. So that's going to be another minus three bonus. We have two of them in effect. That means if we harvest from this location, we're almost assuredly going to gain an element. Okay. All right, so we've drawn our card, we've moved, time to roll skills. Uh, again, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to roll navigate and explore. I'm going to fail survival. We've got plenty of food. We're just going to eat up that food and we'll see what we get here. Now we have a two, uh, for the Wind Rider and a Hex uh, for the Gold. And we have a 4 for the Sage and a 9 um, for Gold. So we do not get Gold here. We do get Gold here. And that's a Hex. That means we get one Tier 1 resource. I'm going to select Lumber because we don't have enough of that. All right. And I'll set this aside. And at least we are here. That means we have secured the lighthouse. Once you secure this token, you flip it over and it becomes um, the orange version of this token. Um, and so now this is a location that we've secured and now we have access to this special ability at the bottom. Now, if it is secured, defenders within 10 hexes of the lighthouse gain plus one range. So I'm going to increase the range of our tower of our um, city state one and uh, of the temple okay amazing all right so that's the end of the skill phase. Now it's time to harvest. I think we're going to take uh, some of that true air and true earth that we're going to try and gain a minus six bonus to harvest elements. If I look at my terrain card here, <clears throat> we find that a sky tile will give you a harvest of three. You, you roll three dice and for each hex, you need to get a hex in order to get this. But for each hex, you get to choose one of the, the three um, resource types. So I'm going to roll the harvest action for all four of these locations that are in range. Now we're in range of the token, of the, the water token. So if we um, take this one, we're going to get that water, um, that water element. For the other three, we are going to uh, get to choose a die to roll, an element die to roll, and based on the choices, we may or may not get an element. But at least we do gain the uh, the water if we uh, if we roll. Okay, so it's a sky tile. For every one location on this sky tile, 
that we're harvesting from, we roll three dice, and we need a X or lower to gain um, any of the three. Now, because it is these two cards are good, uh, are a minus three bonus for the element, I'm going to just try and go for those elements. So we have a two that becomes a hex because of the minus six. An eight becomes a two. So unfortunately, that's still not good enough to get um, to get a uh, hex. So for one of the locations, we've rolled three dice and we have one success. The next location, we have another success. This three becomes a hex and the seven because of the minus six becomes a hex. So now we have three total uh, elements so far. All right, number three. Um, and we have one more, so that's four. And then finally, the fourth one. And the fourth one, we get two more. We have got, because of these two cards, we've gotten six elements in this harvest stage. Now, elements in the harvest stage, again, are going to go in your harvest yield. So I'm going to write down six here, actually five, because we're picking up this token and we just get the water right off the bat. So five, and I'm gonna write down the water right here. And I'm gonna pick up this token. Okay. <clears throat> so that was amazing. Um, and then we have, uh, after the harvest stage, we have Jaythi's card. So we're gonna see what she's doing to us. Oh my gosh, it's the siege. I, so it's the siege. So had we not gotten this uh, lighthouse, we would have lost it. So I'm glad that we went to, to gain it. So uh, a siege is upon us. The first thing we're going to do is roll for the uh, icon in the bottom right. It is uh, blue. So we're gonna roll that blue die again. And it is another water. So I'm going to place another water right on top of here, the first slot. So now this first slot has three siege opponents attached to it. It has one void and two water. The second siege slot has one water. Okay, so at the end of this villain phase, when a siege card is drawn, we immediately move into the siege. So the first thing we're gonna do is read the top here. The harvest stage ends. For each siege stage triggered this game, add plus one to the calendar, right? So this is the first siege, so we're just adding one. The calendar is now at three. And add a plus one to the imbalance. And that's gonna be the water imbalance. I'm going to flip Jaythi's card over, and we're going to see a water imbalance becomes a one. Okay. All right. Now, um, we are going to move through the process of uh, going from the harvest to the siege. So the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to play all end of stage effects in the order uh, that we have drawn them. It, so we're looking at the harvest cards. There's three of them. We have a end of stage effect for every three platinum gathered this stage gain one more. Now that is going to be down here on the bottom of our harvest yield. We've gained 10, so for every three, that would be nine, so three times, we gain one more. So we gain three platinum, and so that becomes a 13. Then for each, um, let's see, these are kind of the same because it's true air and true earth. So for each earth rolled at the end of this stage, gain one earth on any opposing roll instead of gaining nothing. For each air rolled at the end of this stage, gain one air on any opposing roll instead of gaining nothing. So 
basically what that means is um, we're assured to gain either a air or earth if we choose to try and uh, attempt to gain those elements. So let's take a look at our harvest yield. We're going to move all of these up here, okay? And then we're going to uh, roll for our elements to see what we gain. So the first thing is that four lumber goes right up to the top. We now have 10 lumber. We have two sky metal. We have 17 platinum. And we have five elemental dice that we can roll to gain elements. Now, I know my wind rider wants to gain a fire. So let's see if we can gain a fire first of all. I know that we have bonuses to gaining the earth and the air, but we're going to try for fire anyway. So when you're rolling to gain elements, you roll the die specified. In this case, we're choosing to roll fire. And if you gain a fire result, then you gain the fire element. If you gain a fire surge, you gain two fire elements. If you gain anything else, you gain nothing. So we have 50% of this die is a different element type. We're going to see if we can get the fire out of this die. And we do. It's one fire. That means we get one fire element. Uh, and we have four more dice to roll. Okay, so in order to make sure that we gain something, I'm going to select two earth and two air. So we're going to roll this, these dice uh, twice. Okay, so we have air and we have air surge. So we, because of these two rolls, uh, actually on the earth die, uh, you gain earth on any opposing roll instead of gaining nothing. So we gain earth and we gain a air surge, which is two. So I'm going to give our air one, earth, sorry, our air two and our earth one. All right, we're going to roll these again for the last two elements. And we have a air and an earth, which is kind of funny because the air die rolled earth and the earth die rolled air. Okay, so after we have erased our harvest yield, we find that this is the resources we have. We have 17 ore, 10 lumber, two recruits, two uh, sky metal. We have four air elements. We have one fire, one water, and we have two earth. We have three dots filled in on the calendar. Okay, so the next thing that happens is we look at our passive effects. There are three passive effects on the top of the resources placard. If you have at least four essence, four sky metal, or two specialists in the stockpile, you're getting you're gaining some extra um, bonuses. We don't have any of those, so we do not get any extra passive bonuses. Okay, the next thing that we do is we have the token removal. So we're removing any imbalance tokens that are currently on the board, and we flip over any hex tokens to their imbalance side. Flip that over to its other side. Now this means that this location has a earth, because these hex tokens on the back side of the hex tokens, they have one of the five elements on them. And this is another way that you can use uh, these hex tokens in other Hexplorit games. So let's say you're playing Valley or you're playing Sands or Domain. Instead of using the hex tokens in that box, you can use the hex tokens that are in this box because on the back side of these hex tokens are an element. And so what that means is when you have finished something um, in you know, the other game, you can actually go to that location and gain an element out of it. Now, once you gain the element, then obviously it goes back to that hex token once more. It's not going to become a new location. But in this game, if you take those uh, hex tokens off the board by gaining the element, you are effectively uh, basically regaining that location. So we can go back to that uh, antiquity site uh, again after we have cleared that token away from it.
Okay, so then we have the siege opponents are revealed. So we're going to flip over the top card of each of these siege opponents. We have frost imps have arrived. Looks like they have uh, soar and they have the range of a uh, hex tile. So they have the same range as we do. And I'm going to place that here. Then we have uh, Suhuagan Nation, and they are going to hurt us. Looks like they um, have a smaller range. So their range is the size of a um, sky tile. And they are the second one. Okay. All right. Now we are going to roll to place those siege opponents on the board. And we are right next to siege number five. If they arrive, uh, we can take some serious damage here. Um, all right. So let's, let's see what happens. Um, the first thing that we do is let's take these dice, move them out of the way. Move everything out of the way. We are going to roll a 10 sided die and a six sided die to place this banner. So that would be number two, and we get a uh, roll of one, which is that way. And that's going to be all the way over there. So I like that result. You grab a hex tile. Let's place it on the board. And this guy is going to go right there. Okay. We're going to roll again. And we have five. Oh, no. That, oh, no. Okay. I was reading it wrong. Seven. That's going to be here. And five is right on top of that location. So this is interesting. If siege banners get within range of those tokens, they pick it up and that becomes an imbalance for Jathy. So because we rolled seven and five, which is this right here, this banner is going to pick up that token and take it away from us. And now earth is also an imbalance. So I will flip over the card here and we write one in the earth imbalance. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right. Now this token has revealed one over here and it's going to be moving right into this location. So we're going to place this on the board as well. Oh no. And there's number five uh, temple. So we have Temple 3 and Temple 5 are now on the board. So I'm going to make sure that those locations have their resilience filled in. Temple 3 and 5. All right. OK, and that is the end of the uh, harvest stage. The siege immediately begins, and the siege, uh, that means that the siege opponents will immediately move. Now, Jathy is not on the board. Um, she would be on the board if this calendar was up all the way to the top uh, right here. So she's not going to be uh, uh, showing up in this siege. Just those two are. So, <clears throat> by looking at the siege banner, we see that their movement rate is two and two. So both of those siege banners are moving two hexes closest to the uh, closer to the nearest magnetic defender. I know that's a mouthful. Magnetic defenders are either city states or fortresses. Now we have no fortresses on the board. We have a tower, but it has not been upgraded to a fortress yet. So we are going to count to see how far away these are. In fact, this one is close to either one. So we're going to roll a die and we're going to go evens odds or odds evens even. OK, so it's heading to Manchu Patra, uh, Pacha, which is our home city state. It's going that way. 
This guy is only closest to, to here. So we're going to go one, two, and it is within range of this uh, temple. So we're going to pick up this particular card, uh, which is the Frost Imps. That's the first siege banner. And we're going to look at it. Frost Imps have five. Uh, so I'm going to write that down on the battle mat. They have five resilience and they have two power. All right. And their range is definitely within, uh, definitely within range of the temple. So they're going to do two damage to temple number five. We're simply going to erase that eight and it's going to become a six. Uh, and then heroes in range without an augment. So for six non-lethal, so we're not in range. We don't have to worry about that. Okay. And this one is not in range of anything. So that's not going to do anything yet. Um, let's see, it has a passive. Yeah, okay, it's passive is not gonna go off this turn. Okay, so I'm gonna set those cards aside. And now we have the reaction where our towers and defenders can react. Now the only defender in range is our temple. Our temple has one potential and one strength. This is dismally bad. We did not spend any of our resources to upgrade anything. Uh, I was going to wait to do that. I didn't think our siege was going to happen right now. The first, uh, pretty much the first card in, because we placed two cards on top of JT's deck at the beginning. So that meant that that siege was right on top. <clears throat> Now that also means that we're going to have at least three or four cards into the next um, session, the next harvest stage before we have another one. Okay, um, let's see. We're going to roll one potential die and we need a one or lower. And it's a six, so we do not do any damage to this particular siege opponent. Okay, let's do this. So we are going to clean this up a little bit. Uh, we have three cards here that we're gonna put in the discard pile. Um, we also had that resource card that we gain the 10 extra platinum that I did not take before. So I'm going to add that into my resources placard as well. We have 27 platinum. That is going to be enough for us to buy uh, several towers and actually uh, improve those towers into fortresses as well. Um, okay, so let's put away these cards too uh, for JT's deck. <clears throat> uh, okay, and then I see a couple of boss uh, tokens that we need to place. We have a few boss layers on the map. I did not place tokens for. So we have boss number two and boss number seven on the board. <clears throat> two, four, six, and seven. Okay, so that is going to conclude the villain phase of the uh, first initial siege uh, that has happened. And so at the end of each game turn after a siege round, uh, we're going to erase one of the calendar um, bubbles. So we have, are now down to two calendar bubbles. And that means in only two more rounds, two more game turns, the siege opponents uh, will cease to be on the board. Those siege portals will close and uh, we will be in the harvest stage again. Now, <clears throat> that is because we had the siege occur right away at the beginning of uh, that, um, that Jathy deck. It is a new game turn. Now that it's the siege phase, um, we do not draw any harvest cards. Uh, so the first thing that we're gonna do is move. 
I think what we're going to do is head on down to the temple that is far to the south here. Uh, there's a lot of activity coming up uh, over here, um, but I think I can get there before the siege portal um, gets close, and therefore we won't be taking any damage from that siege opponent. They hit hard, so if we get into their range, the heroes can very easily uh, get wiped out by those siege opponents. Okay, because we have Soar, we can go right over the top of that sky tile. So I'm going to move one, two, three, four, five, and six. We are going to move, um, that would be recklessly. We're going to suffer some energy drain from doing that. Um, and then we're going to roll skills. I'm going to fail um, on the food. Fail survival, uh, so that means we're going to roll uh, our explorer and navigate. And we have a hex on navigate, which means we're actually saved from wandering. <clears throat> so we will stay where we are. Three does not make it, 10 does not make it, six does not make it. So no gold, uh, but at least we stay where we are. And that hex is gonna give us one more uh, tier one uh, resource, and I'm gonna take another lumber. Okay, let's move this out of the way. <clears throat> now that it is uh, the event phase, we've moved, we've had our skills. It's the event phase. We're gonna pull out the temple placard we're going to check out to see what we can do here. So first of all, heroes heal all lost vitals and negate any conditions upon entering a temple. So we are all the way back up to full. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the group may complete any number of actions listed on the temple placard. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is let's augment some of these elements that we have. Now, um, to do that, I think we're going to actually augment the uh, temple itself, because if we augment all four basic elements, and we have uh, all four of these elements, if we augment all four to this temple, um, we will create the temple fortress, which is a special fortress. Uh, it is the pink version of the, of the fortress and it will boost all of the temples on the map so it's going to be a really good thing for us because we have revealed so many temples and by doing that it's going to set us up to have a multiple um, location um, uh, defender that can really hit the opponent's heart now i know i was thinking about uh, adding fire to my wind rider but we'll just have to get another fire a, a little bit later on so i think we're going to do that um now we only have two recruits in our uh stockpile so during the uh during an ongoing siege you can only upgrade your defenders equal to the number of recruits in your stockpile so we can only increase uh two each turn basically take elements and put them onto the temple. So let's take one earth and one air, and we're gonna put that onto the temple. Earth and air. So I've just filled in those two locations on the uh, tracker. And if we uh, fill in the water and fire, we're gonna be able to place that temple fortress down. Okay, so um, let's see, what else do we wanna do while we're here? <clears throat> we can uh, summon essence, place an elemental token on each elemental portal that does not contain one. So we have one elemental portal here. We could put another water token on that location just by being in the tower. That way the next time we go there, we can pick up that token and get another water element okay what else we can teleport teleport to any other revealed temple or we could uh looks like we could do a dedication we don't have any specialists we don't have enough recruits i haven't been focused on getting those 
So I think let's go ahead and just teleport. We're going to teleport to the uh, to any other location on the map, any other temple location on the map. So we are going to teleport all the way over to here. OK, and that's going to actually open up uh, another section of the map. And because I am playing the Wind Rider, it will actually open up um, two instead of one. Like that. Okay. All right. So that is going to be the end of our turn. Now we are going to have the villain phase. In the villain phase of the siege, we are only going to have the siege tokens move and then our defenders defend. So this one is going to move too. It is not in range yet of the temple. This one's going to move too because it's moving closer to those magnetic locations. This temple will be attacked by that siege opponent. So again, that would be the frost imps. And it is doing two damage to that temple. And this temple now only has four resilience left. And this temple is the dismally um, uh, bad. It does not have a, a, a very good potential or strength so we're simply going to roll one die and we need a hex on it and we do not get it so no damage yet to any of the siege opponents on the board and that's mainly because i haven't spent any resources in increasing any of those locations yet okay so that is the end of that game turn next game turn um let's move just one well first of all we should stay here and just impart the other elements. I think that's what we'll do. Okay, so I've raised a bubble on the calendar. And for the next turn, we are just going to stay in this location. And we're going to impart a couple of um, elements into the temple. So we're camping in place. We get to roll our skills. Okay, and we're going to eat some food here. We're almost out of food. So we're definitely going to want to buy more of that. No, we do not get any gold. And because we are camping, we are not going to be wandering. Okay, uh, then the next uh, part that we're going to be looking at is the event phase. We're going to uh, spend those few elements that we have to increase the, uh, to gain that temple fortress. Okay, so looking at the temple placard. If the group augments all four basic elements to a temple, flip the temple tracker over to the temple fortress side, place the temple fortress uh, token on the center hex of any map tile of your choice, then add all temple resilience into one total. The temple fortress and all remaining temples are now magnetic. Um, if the temple fortress is destroyed, all temples are also destroyed. The temple fortress is considered to be a temple and may not be rebuilt. Okay. So we are simply going to place this temple fortress on any location of our choice. And I think I'm going to place it right here. Even though it's in the water, we're going to place our temple fortress right there. Now, this is going to mean that we flip our temple tracker over to the temple fortress side. And we're going to gain the details that are that are on here. So. Um, what I mean by that is we're adding up all of our um, health or resilience into one. So that's eight, eight, and four. So that's 20. Okay. 
1t. And then if we look, we have modifiers to potential range and strength. So now all of our temples uh, gain a plus one potential strength and range. So we have one, one, and two. So that's two, two, and three. And then we also get to keep those four elements that we've imparted. We get to keep those on the temple. So our temple fortress, it looks like this. So two, it's rolling two dice, uh, two or lower to hit, and we have three uh, for the range. So all of our temples now, a little extra range. <clears throat> Okay, and they're all um, magnetic, which means our siege opponents will be drawn uh, to those locations. So that's pretty good. Um, we're going to move into the villain phase uh, after our event phase is complete. You know what? I'm going to take advantage of the Wind Rider's ability, and we are also going to attempt to... Um, do uh, yeah we are going to use the wind rider's ability ascend this mastery may be used up to once per game turn outside of combat during any phase to move the group up to one third ascend rank hexes now ascend is only rank two so i, I can only move up to one hex using this ability um and we are going to move into the uh, antiquity site that is on this side of the map. I'm going to move one. And because it's still the event phase, we can attempt to do um, a one of the two commissions that are revealed. So I think we're going to try uh, blood sacrifice. And that's what we're going to do. So this is a pick up this one. We can cross the boundaries governing our realms of existence. Often transitions of this nature require the ultimate sacrifice in blood. The people are happy to give of their essence for this divine purpose. A macabre halo built from their spirits will protect the sanctity of our lands. All right, uh, so this is also an equip uh, and it's going to give the defender plus three power. Oh man, if we get this, we can put it onto the Temple Fortress. And instead of having uh, two for the power, it would have five for the power. So I think that is pretty darn good. Um, let's try and see if we can gain this. Now, each of our heroes will have to make um, the skill roll in order for this to be successful. Now, we don't need both heroes to make all rules. We just need one hero to make navigate and another hero to make um, explore. So hero number one, Wind Rider. We have rank four, and it's a fail, and it's a fail. Okay, so it comes down to the Sage. The Sage has rank three and six. Can they pull it off? We have a green hex. Okay. Now we have we do not have uh, a success on the explore, so we can bring our success into the next game turn. That means basically that we only need to make yellow now in order to gain the benefits of this card. So I'll leave that here for now. Okay, so we have the next step of the game turn is going to be the villain phase and our siege opponents are going to move closer to the next magnetic location. And I guess actually, it's actually within range of both one um, and the, the fortress. So let's go with odd and even, let's see what it targets. And that is even. So it's gonna go right here. Okay, and then this one is going to stay where it's at because it's right next door to temple number five. And then they are going to do damage. Okay, so the first one, our frost imps are going to do two damage. So our temple fortress goes from 20 to 18 resilience. 
Then we have the uh, Suhuigan Nation with a power of one. Because they're in siege slot two, they get a plus one. So they're also doing two damage, dropping our fortress down to 16 resilience. Okay, now our fortress gets to roll two dice, <clears throat> and we are going to be able to roll for both of these. So both will get a chance to hit. Let's go for the fortress first. So we have actually uh, one success. So we will be doing one damage to the Suhuagin. Go from seven to uh, from eight to seven. Okay, and then the temple number five is going to attempt to take um, some dam to damage the frost imps, and we get a hex. So that is actually going to be two siege damage. So that five drops down to a three. Sadly, it's not enough to actually uh, deal enough damage. And because this is the last uh, round, the last turn of the siege, we're going to erase that calendar icon. And that is going to mark the end of this siege. So we're going to transition into the harvest stage. So we're going to move these guys back over in here. And I have some bad news because we didn't kill them. Those are going to come back later, full resilience. So we didn't do enough to actually destroy them. We flip over the cards. Okay. And then we are going to look at um, starting the harvest stage. Let me put back this blood sacrifice card and let's move this back here. Before I do that, I I want to take a moment and just kind of talk through um, the the concept of this game so far. So we're building this game with the idea that um, it's high adventure and you will be really using all the resources you have to build up your defenders and uh, do some damage to these to these siege opponents. Now, we didn't really see too much of that happen just yet because I haven't actually used any of our resources to enhance our defenders. So in the next video, I'm going to show you how I'm going to enhance all of our defenders. And uh, then we can kind of show you a little bit more of how the next uh, part of the progression of this game is going to happen. In the next upcoming video, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper. We're actually going to spend our resources to enhance our defenders. You're going to see some magic happen with this uh, elemental temple that we've built. Uh, the temple fortress and um, you're also going to see Jathy I think get revenge on us next turn as well because she's going to actually be a bit more powerful uh, because I have a feeling that the uh, next siege is going to happen uh, a little deeper in the stack. Now in the next video I'm not going to take as much time to go through every step of the game turn sequence. I'm just going to kind of play uh, and we'll we'll talk through it different times in that video. But for now, I hope you've had a great time watching this video. Uh, I've had a great time playing and I can't wait to see what we're going to do with the, uh, the with the next siege. Thanks for watching everybody.